satisfied with Jesus. And we are going to start with our uh, a song, Wonderful Words of Life. So at this time, um, I'm going to invite our pianist, Bonga, to lead us as we join together in singing Wonderful Words of Life. Yesterday, and he is a theology student hailing from Soweto. Let us pray. Eternal Father God in the highest, Lord, we know that you are here. We are just inviting ourselves into your presence. We pray, Lord, that you fill your speaker with the Holy Spirit, give him wisdom. 
Give us willing hearts and minds to receive your message into our hearts. May we be transformed and, and ushered into a dramatic experience with Jesus Christ. Change our lives. Save us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Karabo. So you didn't come to hear me. You didn't even come to hear the praise team or the pianist. You didn't even come to hear the singing group Firm Foundation. Who is Firm Foundation? You'll find out in a moment. But uh, we have come to hear wonderful words of life. And that is why we're going to sing this, our theme song, inviting you to stand as we sing more about Jesus.
Day is going great. My microphone is not doing great. All right. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, let's go to the book of Job. Book of Job. Hope nobody's going to the New Testament. <laughs> this one is Old Testament. Uh, if your neighbor is going to the news, you help them out. Anybody celebrating a birthday today? Anybody? Here this morning. Oh, yes, raise your hand. She's not here. Uh, nobody celebrating a birthday today? This is very rare. Usually there's someone. Nobody, huh? I see a hand over there. Okay, there's no one celebrating a birthday today. That's all right. Okay, Job chapter 1. If you have your Bible, our key text is verse 20. Before we read it, let us pray. Father, may you please once again set me free from self. Help me direct your people to you. Grant me your spirit. Do the same for your people so that we live in accordance with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Job is a classic. It is a book loved by poets. Um, it is a book read by theists, atheists, skeptics, agnostics. It has a beautiful story. Some people, because of the, the suspense, because of what happens in the book, they tend to question if um, this, if Job existed, if this is a true story or not, I have one way, just one way I'm going to share with you that for me, um, besides believing in, in God, divine inspiration, believing in scripture, there are a couple of things that indicate that this is a historical person and the events we're going to read are historical events happening to a real person, time and space. Job, verse 1, the Bible says, There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright. This book begins like every other historical book. It begins by mentioning a, a place, the land, um, and then it begins by mentioning a person. First it mentions a historical place, and then it mentions a historical person, and then it presents the description of this person. But that's not all. When you go to the book of Ezekiel, Daniel is mentioned alongside uh, Job. And we know that Daniel was a historical person, not just by scripture, 
Um, in 605, the Babylonians invaded Israel. And in the Babylonian Chronicles, not just in the Bible, in the Babylonian Chronicles, they recorded that in 605 they invaded um, um, Israel and they took some of the young people captive, the same thing you find in the book of Daniel chapter 1 verse 2. And so outside of scripture, we can verify that the events that, were, um, that are presented in the book of Daniel and Job and Daniel, Ezekiel, all these guys are presented as historical, historical figures. Now, verse 20, come with me to verse 20 of chapter 1, the book of Job. Verse 20, the Bible says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. This verse, if understood and interpreted in light of its context is a blessing. Yesterday evening, we, by the way, the story we analyzed yesterday evening, at the end it says, by the way, this is a true story. The preacher in that story is me. I was with those two kids. I wrote that after I had interacted with them. And so we can be satisfied with Christ, but the truth is that this world is full of trials. This world, we, we find suffering, um, evil, and in the context of evil and suffering, we are supposed to be satisfied with Christ. And as we look at the story of Job, yesterday we ended with the great controversy. There are two sides. This morning we're going to look at the great controversy and the decision that we need to make. We need to choose a side. And not choosing a side, this is if, you, if we don't choose God, we automatically are left to the other side defenseless. And the book of Job is, is a book that illustrates the great controversy. You know, there was a time in college when I was really taking my spirituality seriously. I began to pray and I asked God, open my eyes. I would pray I would fast every Wednesday. I did this for three years. And I would pray and pray and pray and pray. I say, Lord, open my eyes. If you are real, I want to know that you are real. I want to make sure that you are real. Because if you are real, I should live my life in accordance to your will. If you are real. If you are not, church is a waste of time. Reading the Bible is a waste of time to a certain extent. Although even if God doesn't exist and you read the Bible, you're going to live a better life. The sense of hope and meaning and purpose that it gives is unmatched in the world. But anyways, I say, Lord, if you are really real, I want to be sure of this. Because this means life is more fun with you. I'll be happier with you. It's best that I align myself with your will. So do something. When God answered my prayer, I said, Lord, close my eyes. I've seen enough. One day I had this dream. It was real. It, was not, I was, it wasn't something that just happened in my head. I saw a lot of suffering. A lot of suffering. Different forms of suffering. And at the end of it all, I saw the devil and people believed that God was the one causing their suffering. The devil was the one causing it, but people believed that it was God. And I could see a lot of people sad, a lot of people weeping, a lot of people burdened, and immediately I woke up and I knew what I had to do. Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. In the Hebrew text, there is an emphasis on this man. It says, a man... There was, and then it says, the man, he. There's an emphasis on Job. Uh, grammatically, English today, if you write it in the way that the Hebrew text is written, you would be laughed at. But there's this emphasis on this man. This is the man. There's something about this man. And the Bible goes on to say he was blameless and upright. Not only was he blameless and upright, the Bible says, one who feared God. He was not scared of God, but he had this reverence for God. He was aware of God's presence. 
The Bible says, finally, he turned away from evil. Notice that him turning away from evil is mentioned after the fear of the Lord is mentioned. Because of the fear of the Lord, because of the reverence of the Lord, the Bible says he ran away from evil. The Hebrew word used for ran over here can also be turned off. You see, when you want to grow spiritually, and in light of the influence that we discussed yesterday, when you want to grow spiritually, there are certain environments you have to run away from. There are certain things we watch we need to turn off. There are certain things we listen to we have to distance ourselves from them. We have to run away from certain things. You see, in the Bible, running away, depending on context, is presented as a noble thing to do. Temptation is not something you run to. You know, oftentimes people ask, what should I do um, uh, to, 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 to overcome temptation? That's a wrong question. The question shouldn't be, what should I do to overcome temptation? The question should be, how can I avoid temptation? How can I avoid being tempted? In the examples that we saw of people who were influenced by the opposite sex, I forgot to mention one person. One person, my brothers and sisters, that shows us that it is possible to escape, and that's Joseph. But what did Joseph do? Joseph didn't hang around the tree like Eve. Immediately when he noticed that some, I'm being tempted, Joseph ran. You have to run. You have to run. And oftentimes the devil will come at a moment and a period where we are transitioning. And let me share an example. I am young. I am in the midst of young people. And when I speak to fellow young people, I speak openly, and I, I do not, how do, how, do, how do I put this in English? I have no pity, because the devil has no pity. I don't know when we'll have another opportunity like this. There was this time when I was in college. I said, let me take the Lord seriously. Let me devote myself to the Lord. And so as a community, we decided to fast and pray. And we fasted and prayed the whole day. At the end of the fasting, there was someone in the group that invited me to her house so that we can break the fast. <laughs> we wanted to break something else too. So we went. I was eating on the table. And as I was eating on the table, I was with a couple of friends. I remember I was seated on the table. Um, the door to her room was in front. There were other guys with me, friends with me. And she came to the door and she invited me in the room. We had just finished fasting together. We just finished praying together. We just finished having Bible studies together. And the guys who were there were encouraging me to go into the room. I said... And they were blocking the door. They were blocking the door. They were encouraging me to go in the room. I'm on the table. I'm eating. And I said, these guys will overpower me. And they're way stronger than I am. And it's two against one. So I said, okay, let me just relax. I don't know where that calmness came from. But as I was eating and eating and eating and eating, they got distracted. And when they got distracted... Have you ever watched Speedy Gonzalez? You know Speedy Gonzalez? You know Speedy Gonzalez? I ran. They, they didn't see how I passed by them. I had my slippers outside. I didn't even wear them. I just took them. I ran as far as I could. When I felt safe, I put on my slippers and I started walking home. A week after that, everybody knew what had happened. I didn't tell anyone anything. You see, if I would have accepted, things wouldn't be the way they are now. The Bible says that Job ran away from evil. You don't face evil. You don't do that. You run. And especially when you're dealing with the opposite sex. We are born with an attraction for the opposite sex. 
You don't put yourself in a situation where you are struggling whether to do it or not. To, you avoid that thing. Because the longer you do that, sooner or later, you will fall into the temptation. So temptation is to be run away from. You don't face it. You run. Verse 2. There was born to him seven sons and three daughters. He possessed 7,000 7, sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 um, yoke of oxen, and 500 female donkeys, and every many servants, so that this man was the greatest of all of the East. Verse 4. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one of his day, on his days. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. This was a prosperous man. We already know that spiritually he was doing well. But not only spiritually, he was wealthy. This was a man holistically blessed by the Lord. He had everything going for him. And, and the author goes through great lengths to establish that this person was blessed. But then the Bible introduces his children who loved to party. Verse 5. And when the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and con... Send and con consecrate them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. That's ten. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, Thus, Job did continually. The word continually is important. Job continually sought the Lord. He didn't just do that for himself. He did it also for his children. He confessed his own sins. He said, you know, maybe my children have sinned. And because he says that, it implies the things they did in these feasts were not good. And so Job would pray for them. He would present them to the Lord. Now, the following information that comes is something we don't expect to happen to someone so satisfied in Jesus. You don't expect it. And it happens, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? God was the one who initiated the conversation. God is the one who is about to present Job or let me say, bring Job to Satan's um, attention. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it. In other words, doing whatever I will, doing whatever I want, destroying up and down. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered to the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for no reason? Verse 10, Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. Job only fears you. Job only serves you because you have blessed him. Job's relationship with you is a relationship based on interest. He only comes to you because he feels that he needs something from you. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. Job is now telling God to, to, to take what Job has, all the possessions. And this is important because he tells God, remove what he has. But look what the Lord says. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hand. In other words, I'm not going to touch him. Only against him do not stretch your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The devil suggested to God, he tells him, Touch him, remove what he has. God says, I'm not going to do that. You touch him, I don't do that. That's not my business. But you have the freedom to do so. Why? And yesterday's question, why evil? And here we have a good person who is experiencing um, um, persecution from the devil. And we see that the devil is about to, to cause um, mayhem in his life. Why does God allow evil? 
If God wants us to be satisfied with Jesus, why does he permit certain things? I mean, Job, from verse 1 to verse um, 5, is presented as someone who is religious, someone who is righteous, someone who is satisfied with God. Why does this happen? Why does God allow it to happen? It's very simple, because God is love. You see, being loved means you have to give the freedom of choice. The moment you say you're loved, but you don't give the freedom of choice, you are not loved. Why? Because he who loves does not want to be loved back simply because they insist on being loved back. Let me break this example down. A young man comes to a lady and says, hey, from now on, I love you, you love me, and we're getting married. Never met, never had an experience together, and she says, I love you too. That's not love, because love takes time to develop. Not only because of that, she is loving, not because she wants to love, she is loving because he wants her to love him. That's not love. And so if God, who is love, is truly love, he needs to give the freedom of choice. And when you give the freedom of choice, that means there's a possibility that one day you will not be chosen. This is why love is not for the faint-hearted. Because love is opening the door, letting someone come in, but giving them the keys to live whenever they want to. And so because of God's nature, he could only create and create with the freedom of choice. And once you give the freedom of choice, sooner or later there's a possibility that the other person will not choose you, will choose something different. He's not only love, but he's also strong. So he withholds himself and he lets us choose. And Satan chose something different. And he allowed him to choose something different. And God had decided to make a plan. Now you could say, okay, create human beings, but don't give them the freedom of choice. God can't can do that. His nature cannot allow him to do that. He has to give the freedom of choice. Create human beings and make them mechanical. Make them obey everything. Don't give the freedom of choice. He wouldn't bear that. Okay, give them the freedom of choice, but when they do something that goes against your will, kill them right away and create other human beings. Well, that's fine. Kill Adam and Eve right after they sin. Create other human beings. Guess what? Sooner or later, they'll probably choose something different. So God's life for eternity will be created. They sin, destroy Create, they sin, destroy. Create, they sin, destroy. Why not create? Give the freedom of choice. Let them choose. In the context of the freedom of choice, you let them learn from their own mistakes. So that one day when they get to heaven, nobody's going to sin again because they know what sin causes. So let them choose. When the consequences come, Support them, give them strength to endure their consequences. Let them learn from their consequences. When one day everything is restored in heaven, nobody will be foolish enough to choose evil again because we have learned. And so Satan has his freedom of choice. And you cannot give the freedom of choice and then when people are about to exercise their freedom of choice to go against you, you cut it down. That's not freedom of choice. You inform people. You tell them this is the right way. This is the wrong way. You choose. And even if you choose the wrong way, I'm going to go after you. And I'm going to pursue you persistently, respecting your freedom of choice as I do that. Until you reach a point where you can no longer be redeemed. Then the door is closed on you. And so in this great controversy, we have our decisions. And these decisions are crucial. Satan wants us to choose him. God wants us to choose him. Who are we choosing? And you can say, I choose God, but actions speak louder than words. Habits speak louder than words. What we choose and don't choose, 
Those things speak louder. So Lucifer uses his freedom, verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. I want you to follow with me if you have your Bibles, please. I want you to follow with me as we read. Verse 15. And the Sabines fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Verse 16. While he was yet speaking, this one had not yet finished. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God. Satan is making it look as though it is God who is causing all of these things. The fire of God fell down from heaven and burned up the sheep. And the servants, and the servants, and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Everything he had, gone. Gone. And by the way, this was happening in less than a minute. He's receiving the information in less than a minute. While the other one was speaking, there came another one and told him, this has happened. Another one came, this has happened. Another one came, this has happened. Another one came, this has happened. All of a sudden, now we get to verse 20. Our key text. The Bible says, then Job arose. You know what I believe? As they were coming to bring him the news, they were like blows. Every time he got one news, it was like he went a bit down. And then when he gets another one, he goes down. And when he gets another one, he goes down. And then he's on the ground. Verse 20, then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and cursed God. Is that what it says? Is that what it says? What does it say? He worshipped God. He worshipped God. How did Job do this? How is it possible for you to know that you are righteous? You suffer this way. You lose everything in this manner. But the Bible says he arose not to curse God, but to worship God. The answer is in verse 5. Verse 5 says he used to wake up every day and he would worship. And when he would worship, he would confess the sins of his sons, intercede for them, and ask for forgiveness. This was not the first time that Job was worshipping. It was his lifestyle. It was the one thing that Satan could not take away from him. You see, Satan thought that by removing his children, by removing his possession, he had taken the most valuable thing to him. You see, for Job, you could not defeat him until you took God from him. You could not destroy him unless you destroyed God, unless you removed God from his life. That was what kept him together. That was what held him together. And so the devil, thinking that Job worshipped God and followed God and his faith was based on what God could do for him, thinking that if he removed everything, Job would curse God. But Job doesn't do that. He worships. Verse 21, and he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Naked I came, naked I will go. Job is saying, one day I will die if Jesus doesn't find me. And guess what? I'm ready to die. If it's today, I came naked, I don't have a problem going back. All that I lost, he had given to me. If I lose them, I still have him, and that's fine, as long as I die with him. Can you say that? 
Can we say that? Verse 22. In all this, in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. You see, there is a level of intimacy with God. There is a level of satisfaction with God. Wherein God is actually the only thing, the only person that satisfies you. You enjoy life. You have possessions. He had possessions. He enjoyed his children. He enjoyed all that his wealth could offer him. He really enjoyed all of that. But his satisfaction came from God. Being right with God. That's where his satisfaction came from. And so if you cannot take that away from him, he will not curse God. Satan comes again, chapter 2. The Bible says, Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, sense of humor, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason, I thought you said that if we remove his possessions, he would curse me. God now here is bragging how I wish God would brag about me. You know, one of the reasons that turns people away from religion is how we religious people conduct ourselves. Is how we treat one another. Our character. We have the truth. We spend a lot of time with Jesus, but we have characters of the devil. God is boasting over here. Have you considered my servant Job? This man is upright. He fears me. He turns away from evil. Verse 4, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, all that a man has will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand. He was saying, You, you, you touch him. God said, I'm not touching him. If you want to touch him, you go ahead. You know, sometimes we say that we face challenges and difficulties because the Lord wants to test you. The Lord does not want to test you and me. In the sense of trying to figure out where you and I stand spiritually. God knows where we stand spiritually. When he allows certain tests and tribulations, it's not for him to discover where we stand. It's for us to discover where we stand. It's for us to see. I remember one time I got a call from a friend. He said, I have to go preach at another friend of ours because we had a friend who lost his mother. He was a pastor. Brilliant preacher. Brilliant preacher. And, <laughs> but you know, his lifestyle was something else. He used to drink alcohol. And you know, it's amazing. He would preach well, even when he was drunk. But anyways, he lost his mother, and this other friend, he asked one of my friends to go and speak, but he couldn't go, so he asked me to go, so I went there. And he said, you know, I've, I have preached for, for, for years, I've preached at funerals, I have wonderful sermons, but there is nothing that can encourage me at this moment. There's nothing anyone can say. And I, I don't find anything to keep me believing at this moment. This was his testimony before I would stand up to preach. He says, I've been preaching, but I cannot find faith at the moment. I can't. And there's nothing anyone can say. You see, it's one thing to know the truth. And then to live in light of it.
God says, Behold, he is in your hand, only spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with loathsome sores from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a piece of broken pottery with which he, to scrape himself while he sat in the ashes. This is a, a sad, a sad moment. This brother has lost everything. Now he's also sick. Emotionally, he's down. He's sitting on ashes. He's scraping himself. He has sores on his body. But you know, the Bible says two are better than? Two are better than? Than one. Well, here comes his other half. Verse 9. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. This, this was the person who was supposed to encourage him. Eh? This was the person who was supposed to uplift. I mean, if people are against you, this is the person who's supposed to be with you. His wife was alive, but to him in that situation, she was also dead. His children were dead. Although she was grieving, the wife was also dead to him. Verse 10, but he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. In the following verses, his friends show up, three friends. And those three friends come up to Job. They were quiet for days. Quiet for days. They could not believe their sight, seeing their friend in that situation. And then they began to speak. And they say, Job, you're, this is happening to you because you're evil. You have forsaken the Lord. You are sinful. You have sinned. And, and, and it, it, they, just, they just make it even worse for Job. And, and Job has this back and forth with them. And finally, we get to a very important um, verse. If you have your Bibles, I want you to come with me to verse chapter 19. Chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 1. Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? These ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? And even if it be true that I have erred, my error remains with myself. If indeed you magnify yourselves against me and make my, dis make my disgrace an argument against me, Know then that God has put me in this wrong and closed his net about me. Behold, I cry out, violence, but I am not answered. I call for help, but there is no justice. He has walled up my, he has walled up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness upon my paths. He has stripped me from my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone. And my hope has he pulled up like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They have cast up their siege ramp against me and then camp around my tent. He has put my brothers far from me. And those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maid servants count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their eyes. I call my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him with my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife. And I am a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I loved have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. 
Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Oh, you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. And they are. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. Now we get to the text of which we shall draw this to an end with. Job, in this context, dear friend, has no idea of the conversation between God and Satan. He has no idea. He doesn't know exactly why this is happening to him. He just knows it's happening. He believes he's righteous. Since he believes in the sovereignty of God, he believes that God somehow is behind this, and he is saying, God, if, this, if it pleases you to do this to me, I am okay with it. It's fine. I don't know why you're doing it. I don't know why this is happening. I believe I am righteous, but you are God. You are sovereign. If you're doing it, it's fine. There are a lot of things I don't know, but there is one thing he does know, verse 25, verse 25, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. You see, there are a lot of things Job says, I don't know. I don't know why I'm suffering. I don't know why I'm going through this. But there's one thing I do know, is that my Redeemer lives. And let me tell you something. Sometimes we think if we have all the answers, we'll have peace. If we just know why this happened, why that happened, then we're going to be satisfied with Christ. We will have this peace. That's a lie. The more you know, the more worried you become. You see, Job here introduces us to what Paul calls the peace that surpasses. I don't need to understand in order to have peace. I don't even have the capacity to understand everything and still operate. I'll leave that for God. The most important thing is that he knows, he understands, and I'm going to trust him. I don't need to know everything. And Job doesn't end over there. Job takes us to the future. He says that the last he will stand upon the earth. My redeemer is going to come someday. And he will stand upon the earth. He doesn't end there. He's now, he's now going to speak about resurrection. Verse 26, and after my skin has been thus destroyed, this guy was prepared to die. And he was prepared to die without an answer. My skin is going to be destroyed. He doesn't know he's going to be delivered. He says, I am prepared to be destroyed. He says this, oh, what a beautiful text. Yet in my flesh, in my flesh, bodily resurrection, in my flesh, what will I do? I shall see God. You see, this is why Job was not afraid to die. Because he had an intimate relationship with God. And you know, you know, we can we can say a lot of things throughout this week. And some yesterday I heard twice or thrice, tough times don't last, tough people last. Only if you're with Christ. Only if Let me read the last verses over here. Verse 27. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and no other. My heart faints within me. And I will end with that. Job over here was not afraid of death because he knew that he was connected with God. He didn't understand everything, but he was prepared to die because he believed in the Redeemer. He believed in a second coming. He believed in bodily resurrection. And he believed that one day he would see his Redeemer face to face. He emphasizes with his eyes. Now, this is wonderful. This is good. The second coming is going to happen. Wonderful. Oh, good. My question is, are you in Christ? Because you see, if you are not in Christ, when something like this happens, you cannot get up and worship. You will curse. And you should be afraid of death. 
you should be afraid of dying. Because there, there is no guarantee that you shall see him when he comes. There is no guarantee that you will experience that, that joy of seeing him and then spending eternity with him. Job could react to turbulent situations in this manner because he was satisfied with Jesus. Are you satisfied with Jesus? Being satisfied with Jesus is not reading scripture and that's it. It's not memorizing scripture. It's not even preaching. It's not even singing. It's not even coming to worship. Being satisfied with Jesus is accepting Jesus as personal savior. Remaining in Jesus. That's what, means, that's what it means to be satisfied with Jesus. Now I am not going to waste this opportunity and time to end without an appeal. Bottom line, we have to in Jesus, in order to be able to survive in this world. Evil will always be around, but so will Christ. And if we have Christ, there's nothing to fear. I, I, I usually say there may be someone, I know there's someone. I know. Listen, if you are not in Christ, if you have not accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you really have no guarantee of life after death. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot live in this world with satisfaction in Christ and you will not survive what life will throw at you. Because life and the devil, there's only one thing they cannot take. They can take possessions, they can take everything else but cannot take God. And when you have God, when you are saved, when you are in Christ, you have everything. My appeal is very simple. Very simple. If you are here today, you have not accepted Christ as personal Savior. It would be a sin of me, a homiletical sin, to end a sermon like this without appealing to accept Christ. A very simple appeal. Anybody here this morning who has not made that decision to say that I belong to Christ and that I need to be baptized tomorrow, after tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, maybe I need more study, but I need to be baptized. I want to make sure I give enough time. Anybody here who has not yet accepted Christ and would love to make that decision today. If you are here, I want to ask you to stand. Anybody who hasn't made that decision yet. Now I'm going to just take my time with this. I just want to make sure I give enough time. Usually in moments like this, many questions come up in our minds. Is it time? What's going to happen after I accept Christ? Christ only asks us to accept him. And my job here to, today is to make that appeal. Now, if you're here and you haven't done that, the deciding whether to do it or not is up. I just want to make sure I've done my part. And I, I have this, I have this, how do I put it? Not a trauma, but you see, some time ago I went to a certain country and we were two. And someone preached on Saturday. Never made an appeal. So I want to make sure I give enough time. But if there's anybody here who has not yet made that decision in their life, and today you would like to make that decision, to accept Christ as personal Savior. Whether it's Bible studies you need, you have questions, that can be taken care of. Anybody here this morning who would like to stand and say, I accept Christ, this is free of charge, best decision anyone can make, no decision like it, 
And it's the decision of all decisions. Anybody here this morning that wants to make that decision? Can I close with the word of prayer? Let us pray. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for speaking to us. We thank you for your presence. Father, may you stretch your hand continually towards us. May you have mercy upon us. May you speak to us. And may you help us to daily, daily accept to daily walk in your will, to daily surrender our lives to you. Grant us the satisfaction that only comes from Christ. Grant us that contentment so that Christ becomes the most valuable to us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. God bless you all.